Welcome to the Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva, and today we're going to get some insight on how to recruit for fencing. My guest today is Vince Paragamel, and he's the head coach for Drew University. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So uh, usually I start my guests uh, where they went to college. So where did you go to school? Well, I'm a proud alumnus of Rutgers University in New Brunswick and American University Law School in Washington, D.C. Great. Fantastic. So before we get started, we usually start out the guests, um, what their process was to how they got to become the head coach. Um, so from high school into college, what did you go through? What was your steps of, of uh, picking a school from high school to college? Did you start as early as freshman year or was it senior year? Well, we're talking 40 years ago or 45 <laughs> years ago. Uh, I pretty much knew that I wanted to stay local and in those days it was hunt and peck on the typewriter to go ahead and prepare the applications. <laughs> um, I would say uh, Rutgers was pretty much the top of my list. They had lightweight football and they had baseball, both of which uh, I loved and uh, so that choice became fairly clear. Uh, also was a numeric choice. I, the dollars were there. I'm the first of five kids. Wow. Uh, I knew that the, uh, the grants and the scholarships were not as available back then as they are now. So yeah. we kind of had to look at that. I'm happy with the choices. Was, uh, was, it, was it that school or did you, did you have a few schools that I you had got to A few from? schools I had gotten into, um, but pretty much uh, I liked the atmosphere around Rutgers. I thought coming from a small high school that I would want to go to a big university. Uh, and then I actually downsized when I went to law school. I went from a big university to a small law school. Yeah. So I got to experience both of it. I also got to uh, see firsthand what it was like going through the process with my three kids and I can tell you it's changed immeasurably. <laughs> sure it has. So now uh, you graduate college. Um, how did you go from there to become the head coach at Drew University? Uh, a long and uh, often uh, not straight line road. Uh, I was always involved in athletics and coaching. I had been coaching baseball since about 1976. Um, I love sports. It was always a, a passion of mine. It was always a way of losing myself for a couple of hours uh, and being around, being around the kids and having a good time. Uh, when I had kids of my own, I coached them all the way through school. Uh, but I never envisioned coaching fencing. I envisioned mm -hmm. mostly it was going to be either uh, baseball or soccer, uh, wow. my other two passions. And uh, what happened was uh, my son got involved in fencing um, and it was eye-opening. He got involved when he was in middle school and we found out he was pretty good. Um, and, but we didn't have a local high school team. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of parents got together and we went to the school board and we started to promote having a local high school team. Wow. And they said, well, who's going to coach it? And <laughs> so the parents basically took the bull by the horns. We hired an outside coach. Uh, I assisted. Another coach, another one of the parents on the team assisted. Just come to find out, I guess I was pretty good at it. <laughs> um, and I was taking my son all over the globe basically as part of his fencing. And I said, well, if he's having so much fun and I'm going anyway, I might as well start learning this. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of the skills that I had learned uh, in all those years of sports made a good conversion over to fencing, the same disciplines. And I had always been a catcher, and the catcher's job um, is one of thoughtfulness. He's always analyzing the other team. He's always analyzing his own pitcher. He's always moving his own fielders. And those are the same analytical skills that you use in fencing. Wow. So it was a natural transition. And in New Jersey, we have the benefit of some really stellar private clubs. And so as I'm taking my kids through these private clubs, I'm also getting the training. And I'm taking a little bit from each of the coaches uh, over time. This is, what, 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, and I'm taking little pieces of everything that they're teaching. Uh, I then started doing local competitions and after a while started winning them. And started doing national competitions and started winning them. And as luck would have it, uh, my youngest child came through this. My two daughters came in after my son. They both fenced. My youngest child came onto the team at Bernard's, and they had passed a rule that said a parent can't coach their kid in a varsity sport. Oh my God. So uh, all of a sudden, she's joining the team, and I'm out of a job <laughs> because she has to play. Uh, and I moved over to another, form, uh, another high school team that had just formed at Governor Livingston in Berkeley Heights. Sure. 
and took that team from startup to state championships over a couple of years um, and just stuck with it and cranked out a lot of really good high school level fencers who went on to become very good college level fencers. Wow. Uh, and after about 13 or 14 years, about 13 years, I came back to Bernard's, coached them uh, to some titles, and a friend of mine who was the head coach at Drew said, why don't you come over and be an assistant coach and help me out. Went over uh, last year, uh, helped him out about midway through the season. He had a change in lifestyle, decided he was not going to be coaching anymore and turned the keys over and said, here, it's all yours. So wow. since January, I, uh, I was the uh, interim coach, and then they did a national search, and I uh, was part of the national search and became the head coach officially Labor Day, wow. Labor Day weekend. But it was a tortured and unexpected road, but sometimes those are the best roads. Yeah, so you learned it all the way from uh, high school with your own kids and, and got it all the way into college. That's I, fantastic. I think, I think the perspective is, is one of, I, I know what the student is looking for, I know what the parent is looking for, I know what it means to train. I also found, too, that I also coach a number of middle school programs. So I get the kids good and early and show them the right way train them as a team as opposed to training a bunch of individuals. Uh, give them that, uh, that, in, that uh, team feeling, that team responsibility, and that carries through. Whereas a lot of kids in other parts of the country train just individually with a coach and they have no clue of what it takes to be a good teammate. Uh, New Jersey's blessed by the fact that we have almost 100 high school programs. Uh, with fencing in them. With fencing. I wow. mean, a hundred, a, about a third of all the high school fencing teams in the country are in about 75 miles from where we're sitting right now. <laughs> uh, so this is a great draw. And you'll see New Jersey, New York, and um, Pennsylvania kids in every single lineup on every single uh, varsity team in the country wow. uh, in fencing. So now that brings me to my next question then, um, recruiting. How do you go about recruiting for fencing? What's the process that these high school kids have to do? Well, it's, it's an interesting process and it's gotten, it's gotten better defined over the last couple of years. It used to be that you would go to a private club and the private club would recommend you to a coach or you would try to hound down the coach and uh, see about the coach turning around and, and paying attention to you. Now it's gotten a lot more where the coaches are getting involved in summer camps and they run these summer camps at uh, we run a summer camp at Drew. It's a great opportunity for us to see the kids um, and then for them to get a feel for what it's like to be on the campus. Uh, the fact that I'm a competitor is a big benefit to the university and to my recruiting efforts because like it's summer nationals out in San Jose, California. Uh, I was recruiting out there watching events and the next day I'm competing in events wow. or they see or the kids have actually seen me as a competitor and then they make the connection that that he's also a coach and they'll contact out. Um, Drew has a, a system where if you go, log on to our website and indicate an interest in fencing uh, that will automatically send a note to me and then I'll engage in a discussion of course within NCAA rules engage in a discussion with you about what schools are right for you whether our school is a good fit um, and what our programs about. Um, so it's gotten a lot more defined in that regard um, this year, we're going to be sponsoring the uh, Santelli and Citrullo tournaments on our campus. Those are the largest high school only fencing events in the country. Wow. I'm going to have, uh, over the course of one weekend, over 1,500 high school fencers from New York and New Jersey in our gym, in our <laughs> recreation facility, competing for championships. I can't help it if they see the Drew campus while that's all going on and sure. see my fencers there and, and, and understand the fact that we have a quality facility uh, that's basically hosted nine NCAA regionals and two finals. Wow, that's it's, a pretty good, it's a pretty good facility, pretty good training ground for a small college. Yeah. So now, uh, academically, what do they need academically to, to get to the college level? Well, the, you need to maintain grades, it, clearly. You have to have the grades. Uh, for most fencers, it's not a problem because the analytical skills that you use in fencing generally mean that you're also book smart and have the ability to do your high school homework. But make no mistake about it, uh, you're not going to make it through four years of college unless you've studied in high school. Uh, and you, you are balancing your life as a student athlete. And the word student comes before the word athlete for a reason. You have to make it through on that basis. 
There is a fundamental difference too uh, between Division I athletics and Division III athletics where we are. Um, Division I athletics, the athletics uh, tend to be predominant and the hours that you spend on the athletics are much greater both by rule and by custom. Division III, it's true student athlete. You're there uh, as a student and the athletics support uh, the, uh, the learning process. Now, is it an NCAA sanctioned sport where oh, yeah, they get absolutely. scholarships and things like that at the Division One level? Or? Well, Division One level does have scholarships. Um, the funny thing is, a lot of those schools give out those scholarships to foreign students. They use them as a draw to bring in students from Europe or from China or from, from South America. Um, they use those. The, the athletes come in on visa and they basically get the scholarships, although a lot of U.S. students do get uh, American scholarships to those, um, to those places. But the other part about it is, is that then fencing becomes a job. And I've found that when fencing becomes a job, a true job, it's not as much fun <laughs> as when you're doing it as an avocation. Mm -hmm. um, so from my standpoint, it's Division, division three athletics is, is preferable. In fact, two of my three children went to uh, college as uh, college fencers. Hmm. One went to a Division I school, one to went, went to a Division three school, and I think if you ask the two of them who had more fun and who enjoyed it, the Division three athlete enjoyed it much more. Now, is there any type of uh, money at a Division three level school that, that is able to get these kids to have the school that's interesting enough where, you know, the amount of tuition is also uh, a big thing for parents these days? Well, a lot of the Division three schools recognize the fact that, first of all, under NCAA rules, you cannot uh, give an athletic scholarship to a Division III athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there are other scholarships that I, as a coach, make my players aware of or my prospective players aware of. There are merit uh, academic-based scholarships that coincidentally, because these fencing kids are so smart, mm -hmm. they could qualify for. Gotcha. There are community service uh, type scholarships that we have at Drew that they would also qualify for. What, what happens is that the coach, if he really wants you, then becomes an advocate or at least an ombudsman to make sure that you apply for and get a fair review of every scholarship that would be available. Gotcha. If, uh, you know, that they are not supposed to give athletes uh, any undue preference and there's no undue preference to the athletes mm -hmm. under NCAA rules, however, if you're coming into a, a university, there are so many programs you could apply to, you would never know it. And the coach, if he's doing his job right, makes that prospective student athlete aware of the programs that could be applied for. So a school that looks out of reach becomes more reasonable for these parents. Absolutely, it becomes more reasonable. The other thing too, that, that from a parent's standpoint that I would look for is of all the people at that university that my son or daughter is going to spend time with, the coach is probably going to be that person that they singularly have more hours in front of than anybody. Mm -hmm. And that, that person has to be both a parent and a mentor to that student athlete. Um, and I take pride in the fact I did it with all my high schoolers. I made sure they're okay. I still check on them. I do the same thing with these college uh, student athletes. You know, yeah. I think they're the future uh, of our society. I want to make sure that they get through the university in good shape and that they meet their goals. So what is the recruiting process? I mean, you, you said that majority of the high schools for fencing are in this area. Is, is it where you're just recruiting in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York area, or could you comb the whole country oh, I've looking combed, for these kids? I've combed the whole country. Um, there are a lot of students from outside of the area that we, we all take for granted what it's like to live in the shadow of New York City or Philadelphia. <laughs> to them, it would be a major improvement in lifestyle or they look forward uh, maybe moving from a warm climate to a climate that actually has seasons or uh, they want to be involved in the financial field. Uh, Drew has semesters on Wall Street that become very appealing to those types of students. Things that we take for granted they look at it as special, and I have do done as much outreach as I can to try to bring those students in. That's the beauty of the internet. That same kid can click on a link, whether they're in California, Idaho, or you know, 
right up the street, Jersey. right here in New Jersey, right up the street in Princeton. Yeah. Um, Do you so, also recruit internationally as well? I have had students that have contacted us internationally. We have a special uh, officer who is in charge of international recruitment because the requirements for international students coming into every U.S.-based university, um, there's another level that they have to complete to show competency in English and to make sure they come in through a normal route uh, of application. We also have a program called INTO for non-matriculated uh, students that pulls in a lot of students from Asia, but those students then have to matriculate and prove competency in English to become part of the general university. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a confusing process, but it's a wonderful process. And yes, uh, a foreign student can come in, uh, they just have to go through one or two extra steps. So now, what's the process once the student picks the school? Um, what's the what's the regimen at a Division One level school compared to a Division Three level school? You said it was all business at a Division One level school. So is there a lot more uh, training and practice and things like that compared to a Division Three? What's the difference between the two? By rule, under the NCAA's, um, a Division One school can start practicing much earlier. They can start basically in the summer uh, with the students. They typically wait until the students come back uh, in the fall, late August, early September. And a typical Division I training regimen may be three hours of core and weight training in the morning and three hours of fencing in the evening, six days a week. That's uh -huh. a very heavy schedule, uh, no matter what sport you're doing. Uh, Division three, by rule, you're limited to 19 weeks. Oh. Um, and the way that uh, we run things is that I also give the kids enough time to study. It does not, no good to me or to them to have them not be able to focus on studies and make grades. Otherwise, they're going to be preoccupied. They'll be no good on the strip, and they'll not survive as students. So we typically practice uh, five days or six days a week, about two to three hours a day. And we'll also practice over a uh, break between semesters. We call that winter camp. Hmm. But we stay within the 19-week uh, parameters, as do all the other Division three schools if they're running accor according to the rules. Um, the other thing, too, is, is I allow the kids sufficient time that if they want to go ahead and hit a regional tournament or a national tournament, I will excuse them to be able to do that. Hmm. Um, a lot of the Division one schools will not. Um, we, the odd thing is, is that we fence a Division I schedule. If you looked <laughs> at our schedule, about half of our opponents are Division I teams. Wow. So we're punching above our weight class. Uh, but it gives our kids a great opportunity to make it into the NCAA regionals. It gives us a great opportunity to train against the best. And uh, it gives us a, an opportunity to get the Drew name out in front of others that come to watch those events. Yeah. Now, uh, you said that there were private clubs. A lot of these kids, uh, is high school a mandatory thing where they have to fence at the high school or can they just do these clubs outside the high school? I've seen all different types of scenarios. Um, in a lot of the country there are no high school teams so that if a kid's going to pick up a weapon um, to fence they're picking it up at a private club. In New Jersey while you still have a hundred high, high school programs you have a lot of kids that are not in programs at the high school level. Mm -hmm. They can go to private clubs. But I also take a lot of walk-ons as well. It is, this is one of those sports, uh, and I proved it myself, that you can pick up uh, at any point in your life and within a very short time be competent and in a slightly longer time be excellent. Um, I can get a kid in at freshman year and by senior year, and I saw that at the high school level, by senior year turn him into a state champ. I had one young lady that I put the weapon in her hand for the first time when she was a ninth grader, and then I coached her to a national championship in Sabre wow. before she graduated. That's, that's a heck of a thrill when you're able to do that. But the student has to have some dedication, has to understand that this is a, a sport that yeah. requires focus and has to be willing to put in the time. Now, um, the, the way a student has to do uh, fencing, um, you, is there a, a lot of different avenues that this student can take? When do they start thinking about fencing? Is it freshman year of high school or do they, they start thinking about going to college in, on fencing, you know, senior year? You know, when, when do you start recruiting these kids? Well, as, let's talk about there's a difference between when they think about it and when I think about it. Um, I have seen kids that they roll out of the womb 
and they're fencers. And then I see <laughs> other kids, and we used to see it at the high school level, that when basketball would have its cuts midway through the season, we would all of a sudden get a load of kids joining the fencing team, <laughs> and they would all be tall kids. Um, or you get the kid that thought about it, never had access to it where they lived, or never had the money to do it where they lived, because these are not inexpensive lessons, and they show up at the college and they say, I want a fence. And they've been very dedicated to it. Wow. Uh, I, have a, I have a number of those students on the team right now. And they're, they are intense, they are focused, they love it. You can tell the minute you put a blade in their hands that they're gonna be hooked for life. Um, so there really is no time interval when, a, when somebody can pick this up and like it. I mean, look at me. I mean, I picked it up as a 35-year-old, you know, <laughs> and fell in love with it. The minute, minute I put a saber in my hand, it was like the first time I picked up a baseball bat. It just wow. felt like a natural extension of my body. Wow, and fantastic. You get, you'll find kids that can do that. The key is that you, when they come into college, you have to look at it as a four-year investment that they may not be good the first year or the second year, but by third year, fourth year, you're seeing fantastic returns and results because yeah. they stick with it. And you start as early as what, starting to recruit these kids, junior year of high school? Well, yes, junior year of high school, I'm on the lookout. I do have an advantage because I know so many high school coaches that uh, I can keep an eye on a kid, but again, NCAA rules prevent contact. Mm -hmm. We also have a national register of fencers. I can check anyone, if somebody is registered with the United States Fencing Association, I can check their record from the moment they start competing. Wow. Uh, but you make a mental note. After a while, you can start to see talent and you can see that next jump. You can tell by the way they stand and the way they carry themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not unusual for you to flag somebody, make a mental note, and then a couple of years later, they're in front of you and they are recruit eligible. Now, they're, they're at college. Um, you were saying something about the USA team. Is there a lot of kids that come out from college and try out for the USA team? Yes. And are you part of that? Um, well, not part of it now, the, uh, but the, the USA fencing team are basically amateurs. They are true Olympians in every sense of the word. Um, a lot of those people uh, go a dual track. They uh, apply for the, they try out for the USA team, and they compete at the NCAA level. Hmm. So you see a lot of that crossover. I'm on a, a veteran level team, which is age bracketed. Uh -huh. See, the good part about this sport is you can do it at any age uh -huh. and be up against people of your own age bracket if you so desire. Hmm. So Interesting. Uh, on that basis, yeah, I compete and I still, within my age bracket, a lot of these students, they come through and they've done cadet and they've done junior and then they go to senior level and they work their way through both college but also to pick up enough points to make a USA team or to make a World Cup team or, or some international team. Great. Now, now uh, Drew University itself with, with fencing, um, how is your team doing? Uh, is it a nationally ranked team, so on? Well, right, it, the program is about 90 years old, so it's one of the older programs in the country. I'm told I'm the only f the fifth head coach they've ever had. Uh, the university's made a major investment in the team. I'm the first full-time coach they've ever uh -huh. had. Um, Right now, what our goal is, is to win both of our conferences, both on the men's side and on the women's side. I have largely a young team. Uh, between January and now, I brought in over two dozen recruits. Wow. So if you looked at our current roster, about three quarters of them are freshmen. And I told all the freshmen that by, if they do exactly what we're planning, by the time they graduate, they will have conference championships under their belts. Maybe one, maybe two, wow. but maybe even more. Uh, but we train as a team, they work hard as a team, and we're going to see. We're going to start our season in about a month uh, with a home meet on November 7, and we're going to see how we do against some pretty good quality competition. And how long is the season? The, the season starts from November to when? Uh, it starts from the first week of November, and we go basically to the first week of March. And then they have the NCAA uh, regionals for individuals, and then the NCAA finals for individuals. Oh. Um, and it's a fairly packed schedule. That's fantastic. Well, it, and you've been doing this only a year at the school? Only a year at Drew. Uh, first of, let's hope, a couple of dozen years. And, yeah. But uh, before that, at the high school level. Uh, last year, I had 22 of my alums 
from my high school programs competing at the NCAA level at the same time. So I think I know something about the NCAA level Fantastic. and how to train teams. Yeah, good luck with that. So we're coming to the end of our show. Um, what do you want to tell the parents that are out there about their sons or daughters that want to fence at the college level? What kind of advice do you want to give them? Pretty much that it has to be something that they love. If they're doing it just to get into the college, then they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. The right reasons are that the kid wants to do it, that they enjoy it. Um, you know the minute you walk onto a campus, if you're comfortable on that campus, you know the minute that you encounter the coach, whether you're going to be comfortable with that coach and whether your child is going to be comfortable with that coach. It's the whole atmosphere of it. Um, I would say that a lot of parents, we're a field where the parents push the kids. When, it's when the kid starts pushing themselves, then you know they're ready for a college program then you know that they are psyched in and they're going to treat this as part of that college lifestyle and it's a very healthy part of that college lifestyle. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming to the my, show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time.